So our final speaker today is Nicola Ward, Head of Nursing at Renal Services. Now, Nicola has been a renal nurse since 1993, where she was working at the Royal Free Hospital in London. She's now Head of Nursing at Renal Services, and we're going to hear about the challenges of COVID and what a challenge and dialysis. Hi, thank you very much, Pete. So my name is Nicola Ward. As Peter said, I'm Head of Nursing for Renal Services. And I just wanted to talk to you about COVID-19 and the impact it's had on dialysis. Um, so the agenda today is risks, home therapy versus in-centre dialysis, the psychological impact on COVID-19, and the enhanced measures and their impact that we've had on renal services and what's next, what does the future hold for us? So in the initial days, the main concern was the relative ease of catching COVID. All dialysis patients are at increased risk of becoming severely unwell once they get COVID, mainly due to the multiple comorbid conditions that they have, um, either, either as a cause of or a consequence of the condition, e.g. diabetes. Thankfully, the risk of catching it has much reduced following enhanced infection prevention precautions and the vaccination programme. How effective the vaccines are in dialysis patients is yet to be determined, but as we all know now that the third doses are being offered, and we'll discuss this a little bit later on. So looking at the risks associated with the COVID for the dialysis patients, of all the comorbidities, chronic renal failure, so those not on dialysis or transplanted were found to be at the greater risk of being severely unwell and at a higher mortality rate. The main reason for this being patients with chronic renal failure have a defective immune system. Of course, all patients with a chronic disease are at greater risk than that of the general population. But obviously, our main focus is those with renal failure. When we consider home therapies versus in-centre dialysis, those receiving home dialysis have a lower risk of catching COVID than those travelling to units to receive their dialysis. We're familiar with words like lockdown, social distancing and shielding these days, and they're an impossibility for our outpatient population. They usually have to travel three to at least three times a week to receive their treatment. Then this involves having contact with other patients and staff as a result of this. Also, if a patient or a member of staff became positive in the dialysis unit, it's often brought into the unit with a high risk of spreading to all. Obviously, patients that are positive don't have a choice but to come to dialysis or transfer to their main unit. Looking at the psychosocial impact of COVID-19, Studies have shown that the social, psychosocial impact of COVID-19 on patients receiving dialysis are known to be mod, more moderately worried about the effect of their mental health. We talked about shielding and social distancing earlier and how difficult this is for dialysis patients. Life at the dialysis centre is not set up for social distancing or shielding. You're told to shield but still come for dialysis three times a week. So looking further into the, the impact of um, COVID-19, obviously it starts with the journey. Waiting rooms with social distancing is, is challenging. Even if chairs are spaced two metres apart, are there enough chairs? Do patients have to stand up? Is there room in the waiting room for the chairs to be two metres apart? Just going back to the journey, you often have to travel with other passengers. You're in very close proximity. Um, the other thing is that maybe you're not travelling with others and it's just a single patient journey. And has that impacted on your dialysis time and how long it takes for you to come into the unit? We've talked about the waiting room chairs, but also the same applies to the dialysis chairs in the actual unit. Um, it's OK in the larger clinics, but those in the smaller clinics where the um, dialysis chairs are closer together, are they two metres apart? The very nature of dialysis itself, the close contact for connection, disconnection, vital signs monitoring. It often involves contact with multiple staff who've cared for multiple patients. 
considerations also for those patients that work <clears throat> and if they have a requirement to isolate if there is contact with them with a positive patient in the unit and the impact that has on their working life but also consideration for family life um, you don't have to work to, for the need to isolate to affect your home life. All the above can lead to psychological distress, which may result, result in worsening of or development of anxiety, depression or poor sleep. The concerns related around COVID-19 can also be the cause of patients missing treatment, which in effect increases the risk of hospitalisation or mortality. On a more positive note, those who live alone and have been isolating from family and friends have seen their regular visits to dialysis as their only chance to socialise or see other people. So some do find it positive. It's not all negative. So we've already talked about um, transport and the close proximity with other patients and we're talking about the enhanced measures here. Um, Self-drivers um, can often feel isolated if they're asked to wait outside in their cars before coming into the dialysis unit. It can increase anxiety about being forgotten or will be the last to be connected. We have triage, which seems to have been introduced in every dialysis um, clinic. Sometimes it's done in the transport or sometimes it's done at the entry to the clinic or both. Sometimes you can feel a bit over triaged. You ask the same questions every time. You have a fear that what is it, what if you need to say yes to one of these questions or what if your temperature is high? In my experience, I've had patients not disclosing that a family member is positive due to their fear of being turned away from dialysis. Um, and in the past, that's mean sort of having to isolate whole bays of patients because we weren't given the correct information. Social distance we've talked about. Um, some used to treat the dialysis sessions as a social occasion, built up very good relationships with fellow patients. And they're no longer able, able to freely walk around and reduce your interaction with others. We've also had to take things away from waiting rooms, patient leaflets, for example. These should still be available, but you have to ask. They're not freely available to pick up. Of course, we have the enhanced PPE for staff, in particular the mask wearing at all times. We're familiar with staff wearing visors for connection and disconnection procedures, but the addition of masks makes communication even harder for some, those hard of hearing in particular, not to mention the full respiratory PPE gowns, etc., that you have to wear for positives. Obviously, it's not just the staff that have to wear masks, it's the patients as well. And the same reduces communication, they may feel uncomfortable, and patients with respiratory conditions in particular find difficulty tolerating this. There's a fear associated with this of staff not wanting to care for patients not wearing masks. Some units in the um, height of the pandemic um, decided to reduce dialysis hours. Um, and this was under the instruction of the um, trusts. Um, and obviously this could have led to anxiety of the effect of the condition, dialysis adequacy. And we, also we had the reduction of the frequency of dialysis. Some patients went from three times a week to twice a week. The enhanced cleaning measures often cause delays, ne the next shift not being able to enter the area until the previous shift has left and all the cleaning complete, which obviously left two delays. Some trusts introduce one way systems. Our units are not particularly designed for this. The area is used as waiting rooms, which are not designed for. We have fire exits used as temporary exits to, to make way for the one way system. And with that comes the increased risk of falls. We have toilet facilities mainly in the waiting areas um, and not in the clinical areas. So patients at the end of dialysis often had to go against the one way system to use the toilet back in the waiting room, which meant they're entering a waiting room full of patients from another shift. The routine swabbing, um, lots of the clinics do routine swabbing each week, some do more than once a week. Obviously, this is very good practice and lots of positives have been identified with routine swabbing, but it's not a pleasant experience. And I know for one, I would not want to be having the swab um, each week. We then have the contact swabbing of being swabbed after each contact and the anxiety this leads to. Some will only have it if a shared transport with a positive patient or if they're on the same shift or in the same waiting room, but some do the whole shift. 
Um, so it's very different in each trust. Um, we also have the transfer of symptomatic positive patients to the main trust. Some of the satellite units don't actually dialyse the positive patients or don't have isolation rooms or the facilities to do so. And then we have the anxiety of having to do that and being transferred. And it may be a different shift, maybe a longer journey, unfamiliar surroundings and unfamiliar staff. Unable to swap shifts, this became more difficult with the aim of bubbling shifts, appointments to attend, etc. Um, were very difficult um, when we when patients were asking um, to swap shifts and we were unable to accommodate this. In some trusts, the curtains were pulled between the dialysis stations. Um, patients report to increase isolation and staff report reduced visibility of patients and reduces the monitoring ability and increases the risk. Some patients and some staff do like this though. In the height of pandemic and maybe continued, refreshments were put on hold. Um, and as I said, this is the case, still the case in some clinics or they were served to alternate patients or patients were just encouraged to bring their own um, visitors and carers not being allowed into clinics and the anxiety and distress that this causes to our patients. We then have the impact of the staff sickness and the isolation requirements leading to possible short staff, additional stress to nursing staff leading to low morale and the possible impact of care to patients. And then not forgetting our home therapy patients with deliveries possibly left at the door and delivery drivers not being able to enter patients homes. So moving on, what's next? So we now know about the third vaccine which is being um, offered to our patients. So the UK Kidney Association has reviewed the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation Guideline and is recommending the use of a third primary COVID vaccine in the following kidney patients. So those who've had a transplant, those on the transplant waiting list, all patients on dialysis, and patients who at the time of the original second vaccine were receiving significant immunosuppression. The third primary COVID dose will rely on renal units to identify those who are eligible and it will give patients access to the third primary dose as quickly as possible. This will be arranged either by your hospital hub or by the GP. And then moving forward, what's next? Lots of the enhanced measures remain in place. We haven't changed much at all. Um, in some ways, it doesn't seem so bad. Perhaps we've learned to live with these things now. Moving forward with a layout of new units, consider one way systems and how we would social distance and location of toilets, etc. We'll wait and see. Consideration of other things that maybe weren't so relevant last year. Now the country is out of lockdown. Will flu have a bigger impact or neurovirus? I haven't told you anything today that you didn't already know. I just wanted to show that we do have an awareness of the impacts to patients on COVID and its associated precautions. The aim of everything put into place is to keep you as safe as possible, but we know the possible negative impact, particularly on mental health, that these things may cause. Thank you very much for listening to me. Nicola Ward, Head of Nursing Services, and thank you very much for that insight into your world and a lot of people's world at the moment.